Well, good morning, Life Fellowship. So good to see you here this morning. That song that Jason just sang, I'm not sure if you've ever heard that song before, but that is a song written by Andrew Peterson. And uh, it's a one, his, his entire album on that is really good. But I, I think what Jason touched on is we don't really sing imprecatory songs. And you, know, you might wonder why we don't do that, because if you think about it, I was just sitting there as Jason was like, we don't really have our, in our hymnody songs of, of vengeance and revenge. And, and then I, my mind went to that one song that Carrie Underwood sings about, you know, like slashing up the tires on her, on her boyfriend's car that's cheating on her. And, and I'm thinking, well, you know, we might not sing it as Christians, but we're used to singing those kinds of things. Maybe you find yourself singing along to that kind of song in the car. But, but, but I think when it comes to this kind of emotion, uh, these are things that I, I think we, it's normal for us to feel these things, these feelings of vengeance, but we have a hard time bringing them into a church uh, or environment. Or what, is it, what does it mean to feel these things in the kingdom of heaven? But if I was to name off, just listen to these, just listen to these people. Emperor Palpatine, the Joker, Hans Gruber, Hannibal Lecter, Nurse Ratchet, Lord Voldemort, the alien and aliens in the shark and jaws. When I bring up those names, because what do they all have in common? They're all bad guys in movies. That in some point in the movie, when you're watching the movie, you know what you, at some point you're like, just get them, right? And, and what we're going to do this morning, because in all of these movies, sometimes they're trilogies, but the whole idea is that at some point, these bad guys that I just mentioned that are in movies that, that many of us have watched, at some point in the movie, you're just like, just get rid of them, just kill them, just take them out, Right? There's this emotion we have when we're watching a story on a film that there's this desire in us for justice. And that, that's, that's real because I think that God is, that there's nothing wrong with a sense of, God, we want your justice to be done. But how do we do that in a godly way? Uh, as we've been looking through the Psalms, this is the one Psalm that we don't really know what to do with when we're reading our Bibles. I remember going through... Uh, being taught how to pray through the Psalms. And so I would, you know, I, I remember pick, picking the day of the month and then you add uh, 30 to it. And so you pick one of the five Psalms of that day and you pray through them. And whenever I would get to imprecatory Psalms, I'm like, I, I can't do this. What do I, God, what do I do with an imprecatory Psalm? What do I do with, a God, with Psalms that, that just are asking God to smite someone? And what I think we need to do is understand why these psalms are here. And I think what we're hoping to do, what I hope to do with us this morning, is understand why these psalms are here. But I have a slide for you because we just read a bunch of things in Psalm 58, as you heard them this morning, that are really, they're quite intense. Tearing out things, smashing teeth. In fact, look at these four statements. They'll be on the board of, of different imprecatory psalms. Oh God, break the teeth in their mouths. Um, may they be blotted out of the book of life and not be listed with the righteous is another statement. Psalm 109, may his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. And here's the, probably the one that everyone is like, Ugh, you know, how do I, what do I do with this? How blessed will be the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. What do you do with that? Right, and these are the kinds of verses that people, especially people outside the church, will, will pull up these verses, and if they know you're a Christian or, or Bible-believing or follower of Jesus, they will, they'll, you know, what about your Bible saying this? And you're like, oh, but Jesus, but, but Jesus told us to love our enemies. Well, well then Jesus is contradicting the Bible. So we've got a bunch of questions that we have to ask. And here's the questions. If you read an imprecatory psalm, here's the questions that I ask, and I want to answer these questions for us this morning. The first question is, why are these in the Bible? Why did God in his, sovereign, in his sovereignty and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit put these kinds of prayers and poems in Scripture? That's the first question. The second question is, should we still pray these kinds of prayers? Is this something that, that was right for us? You know, was it right for them, but not right for us? Because you know, Jesus came along and he... And, and in fact, the next question is, how do you harmonize these imprecatory psalms with the commands of Jesus to love our enemies? 
So how do you do that? These are the questions I think we need to answer, and, and I believe that there is an answer to these questions, but here, let me just say this, okay? When someone comes to you with a in this, whether it's imprecatory psalms or something else, if someone comes to you and says, hey, you know, try to explain this in the Bible, and you don't have a good explanation, or you don't understand it, let me just say this, all right? Don't run and hide. Don't be ashamed. There is a reason, and there is an answer to every issue that we might perceive that there's an issue with God's word. So, so let, let me just say this, when, when people come to you and say, hey, we don't like this kind of scripture, or, or is there something in our culture that feels like this goes against our culture? But I just read for you, I just n- named for you one song, and I just named for you a bunch of movies that the whole point of the story is vengeance against wickedness. This is not a, a value that we would say is, it was, is a is not a part of our of our culture but what is is more inherent to the human nature is that there's a deep desire in all of us to want to see wicked taken care of the wickedness of this world that we want to see the the wicked people in this world punished and so so this is what we have now now there'll be some Christians when the when people come to you say well look at this passage in scripture and it contradicts Jesus was teaching on loving our enemies and there have been a couple people that, even Christian scholars that have said, well, here's some explanations. One explanation is, listen, this is in a more primitive time in the Bible. And when Jesus came along, he elevated this sense of, of ethics for us. And so, yeah, this was, this was kind of more primitive times, but Jesus kind of raised the level of ethics uh, in, in Scripture. It was this idea of progressive revelation. I think that's pretty poor example, because I can take you to different parts in the New Testament when Jesus is telling the Pharisees, woe unto you, right? Or when he says at the table of the Last Supper, it'd be better, the person who betrays the Son of Man, it'd be better for them to have never been born. Or Paul says, you know, if anyone preaches to you in Galatians, if anyone preaches to you a different gospel, let him be accursed, in Revelation chapter 6, you have this scene in the, in the throne room of heaven where the saints who have been martyred are crying out for God to bring justice on the earth, on the wicked people. So this is not, this is not one of these things where we, you read imprecatory ideas in the Old Testament and they're not, uh, they're not around in the New Testament. So that ex- explanation goes away. I think the second explanation is, well, this is when these people are, are when David or some of these other authors are, are proclaiming these things, they're, they're, te- they're saying this in an indicative mood, not an imperative mood. They're saying this is, what, this is what should happen to them if God was going to bring justice on every single person, but he's not really asking for it to be done. Well, I think what we just read in Psalm 58, that's not true either. And then the the last explanation some people say is, well, this is what the psalmist, the way we can understand this is the psalmist is writing what they feel. That that he's asking God to bring judgment. That's what he feels. But we in no way should, just because it it records certain feelings and actions of different people. I mean, it records Peter denying Jesus three times. Should we deny Jesus three times because it's in the Bible? But, But again, all of these explanations, I believe, fall short. These are not just feelings, these are things, these are desires that, that God has put into our hearts. And I, here's the main idea I want us to walk away with from Psalm 58 this morning. God's vengeance is good. God's vengeance is good. And we should take comfort in it. God's vengeance is good. And when he pours out his vengeance, we should take comfort in it. Just like in those movements, those moments in the movie, right? When Darth Vader picks up Emperor Palpatine in Return of the Jedi and chucks him into this abyss and he blows them all up, like there's a part of he's like, yes, yes. When, when Sauron, the Lord of the Rings, and the, the final scene when, when the tower comes crashing down and he gets destroyed, there's something that says, yes, what just happened is good. When the guy in Jaws takes the gun, and I won't repeat what he says, but he shoots 
that thing in his mouth, that, that, that container in Jaws' mouth, and the, the shark just blows up into a million pieces. What happens inside of us? Yeah, get them. There's something in us that when we see evil destroyed, we say, that is good. And so when God does that here on this earth, we must say, God is good. That is what the psalmist is asking. And so what, what, the, what, what we're going to look at in Psalm 50, there's really three sections to the psalm. We're going to look at the need for God's justice, the desire for God's justice, and then the confidence in God's justice. And so this is, a, this is what they call a miktam of David. And, and, and we see the need for God's justice in verses 1 through 5. David is going to explain uh, what is going on. There's, some, there's something going on in his life. Now, some people think that this is when uh, it's during the time of Saul, when Saul's trying to attack him. It could be another point in his in his, uh, when he's a king and there's other unjust or unrighteous people that are attacking him. But he's writing this with this experience of he is experiencing the wickedness of people. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you experienced the wickedness of people? Yes, all of us have. All of us have been harmed by people. Some of us, whether it's a bad boss or maybe... Maybe it was just someone that, that treated us poorly. Maybe it was an abuser. Maybe it was something of a, a, a very intense, horrible wickedness that was done against us and to us. But every single one of us has been in the situation of David where we say, God, please act. God, please do something because wickedness seems to be winning. Have you ever felt like that? That wickedness feels, it just seems, it feels like it's winning in our day. And, and so David is writing this in the first five verses. It says, do you indeed decree what is right, you gods or, or, or mighty lords? Do you judge the children of man uprightly? No, in your hearts you devise wrongs. Your hands deal out violence on earth. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray from birth, speaking lies. They have venom like the venom of a serpent, like the deaf adder that stops its ear, so that it does not hear the voice of charmers or, the, or of the cunning enchanter. So David begins with this understanding. Listen, you need to understand who we're dealing with. These are wicked people. Now, I, I believe it's important to, to uh, understand something. Not all evil and wicked people are the same. Not, I should say not all sinners are the same. The Bible makes it very clear that not all sinners are the same. That's, that there are some sinners that sin out of ignorance. There are some people that sin because they've kind of grown up. They, they don't really, they've never been taught. They've never been exposed to the truth. But this, this what David is saying is that there's a different level. There's a different level of evil here. We kind of get that, don't we? We understand that there's different kinds of evil in our world. There are people that do perpetrate evil things, but then there are people that want to multiply evil, and they want to multiply evil people. And what David is speaking here, I think that when you balance the whole idea of asking God, or when Jesus says, I want you to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, and this idea of what David's going to ask for them to be destroyed, I think is in some ways we got to bring into this idea that there are some people that do wicked things, and then there are some people that multiply wicked things through many people. And David is talking about people who are so far gone in their wickedness that they are actually leading other people to do so. And, and so look what he says in his illustration of this. He says, first, these are leaders of wickedness. These are people who judge the children of men. These are people who are, who are devising plans to do evil. You guys remember uh, when, when, when the, the, the two towers fell, twin towers fell in, in New York City, it really began this idea of the war on terror. And maybe, maybe you're, you're old enough to remember what that was like, but it was a big deal, and, and it's, it's been the longest going, you know, running war in American history. But the idea of the war on terror was this idea we are, uh, the United States of America was going over to places like Afghanistan and Iraq and the Middle East to, to, to kill terrorists who want to destroy America. 
And what their plan was, was this. They had, I'm not sure if you remember, but they had a list of, of people, perpetrators, terrorists, that they wanted to take out. And people like Osama bin Laden, right? You guys remember that name. That these were people that they targeted. Why? Because these weren't just the foot soldiers that were do, carrying out the plans. They were trying to attack the people who were making the plans. And that's what David is saying. These are not just regular sinners out there do, causing problem and harm. These are people who are leading these movements. These are people who are devising the plans. The, the, so that's the first, first identifier. The, the second identifier is they've been, they've been doing evil for a long time, and it's getting worse. Again, look what it says. Uh, verse 3, these wicked are strange from the womb, and they go astray from birth, speaking lies. These are people that are progressively getting worse and worse and worse. We see this in the book of Romans. When Paul is writing in Romans chapter 1 about the depravity of, of mankind, three times in that chapter, God says, God gave them over to their lust. God gave them over to their sin. God gave them over to their, to their desires. And in each level, what Paul is saying is, there are levels of progressive evil. There are levels of progressive sin. And at the end of Romans chapter 1, it says, they not only do these kinds of things, they encourage others to do the same. See the, see the progression of you. You don't start doing it. Eventually you get to the point where you are leading others to do the same things. And that's what David is talking about here. These are people who are not just leading it, devising it, but they are progressively getting worse. Thirdly, these are people who are deadly and dangerous. They're not just being mean, right? If someone cuts you off in traffic, you don't call out an imprecatory psalm on someone, okay? That's not, the, that's not the main objective, like, oh, they cut me off. God, strike them down, right? Like, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about people who are, who are deadly and dangerous. Look at verse, verse 4. They have venom like the venom of a serpent. These are people that when they are going to do their acts of wickedness, it will destroy and kill people. So this is an intense kind of evil and wickedness. And lastly, these are people who are unwilling to change. They're unwilling to change. Look what it says in the, end of the second part of verse, five, verse 4 and into 5. Like the deaf adder that stops its ear so that it does not hear the voice of charmers or of the cunning enchanter. These are people who will no longer listen to anyone's direction. So, so I, I want to make sure that when we talk about these imprecatory psalms, we're talking about these things, the people, the kind of wickedness that's not just, we're, we're not to be praying for these things to happen against people, just normal people who do bad things to us. These are people who are, who are the, the, the perpetrators who are creating the, these ideas, these systems, these movements of evil in our land. There's nothing wrong, I believe, there's nothing wrong of asking God, God, stop the pornography industry. There's nothing wrong with God, stop these, these child abusers. God, God stop, stop, stop these people who are, who, are causing, who are selling these drugs, these drug wars. There's nothing wrong with us saying, God, would you bring justice on these people who are causing so much pain and death and destruction in our land? There's nothing wrong with that. But those are the kinds of people that God wants us to be looking at, saying, God, you got to take these people out. These people are wicked and evil, and they are multiplying evil in our land. And so, why are, remember, remember one of the questions was, why are these in the Bible? Why are these imprecatory psalms in the Bible? You know why? Because we live in a world where there are wicked people. You know, we, live in, we live in this world where there is all kinds of, of, of evil being done over and over again, and there comes a point where we're saying, God, please take them out. I, none of us were, I don't think any of us were alive during World War II, but I guarantee you, during, if you lived during that day, there would have been people praying, God, please take out Adolf Hitler, right? And there would have been nothing wrong with praying that because of the wickedness that he was perpetrating, the millions upon millions of lives that were destroyed and killed and affected by that person's, by that man's wickedness, and, and many of his people around him. So, so I think we have to understand there's a need for God's justice. The second that should lead us to is a desire for God's justice. There should be a desire for God's justice. Now, now listen, 
Some of you, when we talk about these, the, this section, maybe you're, we're all sitting there like, yeah, need for God. Yeah, these are wicked people out there. But now we're going to get to some parts that might make some of you feel uncomfortable. Now, some of you are more justice-oriented. And what I mean by that is when you read this, you're like, man, I'm so glad I found this passage of Scripture. I'm going to memorize this one, right? But some of you are really merciful, right? You're just kind of like, oh, you know, I, I, don't want to, I don't want to be mean. You know, my wife and I, my wife's more justice-oriented. And when we were first married, we, uh, we barely made any money. We were going to, I was going to seminary. And in Scranton, Pennsylvania, there's virtually no industry. So like the jobs were like, you could work at the mall, and that was about it. So she worked at Lady Foot Locker, and I worked at Sears, and uh, we would take our breaks together at Auntie Ann Pretzels. It was just the cutest little thing in the world. But we barely made any money, and so when there were times we would go out to eat or spend money on something, and sometimes it, it, spending money was a big deal. I remember sometimes we'd go out to eat, and, and we'd order food, and it wouldn't be good. Something would be wrong with it. Now, my wife is the type of person that's like, I have no problem asking for something new or something better. Because you know what? She's like, I paid for this. Whereas I'm like, I, I just, oh, no, I'm not like that anymore. But when I, when I was younger, I was just so, I was like, um, you know, can, can you just take this meal back? It's kind of, um, no, don't worry about it. It's fine. That would have been me. Now, some of you are like that. Some of you are just so merciful. You, you know, when your kids misbehave, it's like, now next time, Johnny. And Johnny's like, yeah, I've heard that before. That means the next 20 times because you're just so merciful. I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. And so when, when we come to these kinds of verses, we have to understand that there's, there's, there's instruction that whether you are justice-oriented or mercy-oriented, there's things that we need to remember. But look again what he says. Just like there's a progression of evil that, that David explains in the first five verses, there's a progression of justice that David is asking for. Look again in verse 6 through 9. Uh, yeah, it says, let's look 6 through 8. Oh God, break the teeth in their mouths. Tear out the fangs of the young lions, O Lord. Let them vanish like water that runs away. When he aims his arrows, let them be blunted. Here's my favorite. This is my favorite verse. Let them be like the snail that dissolves into slime. I mean, David, David's bringing all of his creative energy into this one. I mean, he is just, he's trying to think of the most poetic things he can say of how he's really feeling. And God, I want them to be like the snail that dissolves into slime. And then the last one, like the stillborn child who never sees the sun. Now, now again, let's look at the progression of what, of what he's saying here. He's saying, you know, I want you to break their teeth out. There's something, what he's saying, first of all, is I want that God, I want them to feel the sting of justice. Give to them what they're giving to other people. Give, if you can smash them in the mouth so that it kind of wakes them up, like, okay, I'm ready to stop doing this evil, start with that. But then what I want you to do is once, once you give them a, a sting of the justice, then the next thing I want you to do is I want you to, to you know, take away their power to harm people. So first, give them a sting of justice. Then I want you to take away their power to harm others. But if those two things don't work, God, go to verse 8. Again, he's talking about death here. God, I want you to take them out. I, I, I'm asking you, God, that you would cease their life because if they will not listen, if they will not first be, be confronted with, with feeling the sting of justice, and if, if you're taking away their power to, to harm other people still doesn't stop them, God, I ask that you take them out. Remember, I think it's important for us to remember that we don't go straight for God, strike them dead the first time. There's a progression here. And so, so what we have to do, when we, when we read these kinds of things, there's a couple things we need to remember. When we see evil flourishing, it should do something to our hearts. It should. And so this is not just about justice-oriented people or mercy-oriented people. Because here's the, th here's the idea. If we love Jesus, if you and I love Jesus, you and I will be more in love with his holiness. 
And we will, more incent- we will be more sensitive to his holiness. And the more that people do to, uh, to, to break that holiness and to rebel against that holiness and to attack that holiness and spread their evil across our land, the more our conscience should be bothered. Listen, if you are someone here that's way more mercy-oriented, praise God for your mercy. But there, there might, God might be trying to teach you to care more about his holiness and be more upset about the evil that's in our land. And I think that, that's, that's, that should confront our hearts. Listen, I, I watched a documentary uh, a, f- a few weeks ago with my family. It was called, What is a Woman? I'm not sure how many of you have ever seen that. And I'm not, I'm not a huge Matt Walsh fan. He, there's a lot of things he says I don't particularly like or agree with. But he came out with this documentary, and, and, and I'm not trying to get political here because I believe that sexuality and gender is a spiritual issue, and it's a sacred issue. But I watched that documentary about what is a woman because of all this gender ideology that is just permeating our culture and schools and shows and all kinds of things. And, and, I, and I watched that documentary, and I, and I walked away. I mean, when that ended, there was just this sense of anger that I had, that there are people that are destroying young lives with this ideology, that that are literally performing, you know, doing things that will forever impact the the, the, the life of these children that they're caught. And I'm just telling you, it, it, it made me angry. And it was one of those things that I had to, I had to pull out my imprecatory psalm and God, I, you got to stop this stuff. God, stop these people. God, God, first, help them to feel, the, the sting, sting them first, God. And God, take away this power that they have to influence all these young lives. Listen, these, that's, so, so I think there's something when we read those kinds of things that we should feel, God, do something. God, do something in our land when we see evil perpetrated and expanded across our land. But, but I, I, I want, so we need to talk to you that are more mercy-oriented, but let me just talk to you, those of you who are more justice-oriented. Because those of you who are justice-oriented, again, are going to want to pull out the sword at the very slightest thing of injustice. You know, some, somebody wrongs you, and you're like, I'm cutting you down, man. You are not going to get away with this. And, and here's, my, here's one of the things that we need to remember. David doesn't make this personal. God, David cares about this, not because he himself is, is receiving all the wrong. He is he's asking God to do something because it is God's righteousness that is at stake. It is the honor and the glory and the fame and the goodness of God that David cares about. And those of you who are justice warriors, you better make sure that it's not your justice that you are swinging the sword for. But it's you're swinging the sword for the justice of God and not yourself. So both, whether you are justice-oriented or mercy-oriented, all of us have to come to the word of God and change our responses and our reactions to evil, whether it's around us or towards us. And so those are, those, are the, those, are the, those are the appeals that I think that we need to make, toward, I want to make towards you this morning. But lastly, David ends with a confidence in God's justice. Confidence in God's justice. And here's, man, when I had to pick out all the imprecatory psalms, I picked this one because of this line in this psalm. Look what it says in verse 10. The righteous will rejoice when he sees the vengeance, when he sees the vengeance. He will bathe his feet in the blood of the wicked. I'm like, I gotta preach on that. Not because I want to, because when I read that, there's a part of me that's like, I don't like that verse. Could you could you have said that a little differently, David? I mean, Holy Spirit, I know you're working inside of him, but I mean, bathing. Feet in the blood of wicked people. <sighs> Sounds a little sadistic to me. And so I purposely chose this psalm because I wanted to understand this verse. I wanted to understand and like what is going on here. But David is saying, I have there's something that he has a confidence 
Again, look what he says. The righteous will rejoice when he sees the vengeance of God. Remember, I, I just mentioned those times that we watch these movies. You know, and when the bad guy gets it, there is a cheering. There, there, even, there are even parties in the movies. There are celebrations in the movies when the bad guy gets it. And we see that and we understand it. And that's what David is holding on to. We, there's going to be a party when bad people fail and fall. And so, so, uh, so what we have here in verse 10, let's, let's go to that, that phrase. He will bathe his feet in the blood of the wicked. I want you to understand that there, in Hebrew poetry, there's this way of understanding Hebrew poetry that we call parallelism. Okay, uh, Parallelism is very similar. Remember we talked about chiasms. I've taught you chiasms in Psalms and Hebrew poetry where there's the, you know, the front end and the back end, and it points to the middle of the text. Well, parallelism is another form of of Hebrew poetry, it's a, or it's, a, it's a, a marker of Hebrew poetry, and there's many kinds of parallelism, par- parallelism, but the whole idea is I say one thing in one line, and I say something very similar to it in the next line. So this whole idea, or it either, in that something similar can either be building off of it, or it could be a metaphor, it could be something, uh, just another way of saying it, but parallelisms are all throughout the Psalms. They're all throughout the Proverbs. They're everywhere in Hebrew poetry. And so what we have in verse 10 is a parallelism. So the second part is related to the first part. So for example, the righteous will rejoice when he sees the vengeance. We get that. We understand that. Well, the second part is the second part of the Hebrew parallelism in this text. And it's referring back to, it's saying the same thing, but in a different way to the first part. So when he says, he will bathe his feet in the blood of the wicked, it's another way of saying, and he will rejoice when he sees the vengeance of, against the wicked. But, but you know, so I think that's one way, if you're going to understand this text, of what he's saying, okay, I get that. But it still feels like, Weird to me. And so, so here's what we have to do. Let's put ourselves, put, let's go in a time warp, and let's go back to ancient Middle Eastern times. And this is something that you and I probably never do, but one of the things that was very common in those days was to wash your feet. We see it all throughout the Bible, people washing their feet. We see Jesus washing feet. I mean, it's all, if you, if you point out all those different times that you saw in Scripture, people washing feet, it happened all the time. And there are two major times that you would wash your feet or someone would wash your feet. And the first time, or first way you see it is it's a lot in the book of, of Levit- Leviticus, right? There's this ceremonial washing that you're doing to purify yourself, your entire body. And so there'd be times when the priests, in order to prepare his body uh, symbolically to show that they were purified, would wash their feet. I don't believe that it's referring to that, that form of washing feet. I, I, there's a second time that you'd wash your feet, and that is if, when you would go inside at the end of the day. When you would do your labor and do your work, and again, this is an agrarian society, people were either stone cutters or they were farmers of, of, of many kinds, but, but there weren't many business people in those days. And so when you were working out in the field and in the dirt and in the dust, there was very few paved roads. When your day of work was done, to signify, I'm done, I'm not working anymore. I'm not going out anymore. There's no more, there's nothing left to do. What you would do is you'd wash your feet and then go inside your house. Or or you'd wash your feet right when you walked inside your house. And it was the the moment that you would be like, "Ah, the day's done. I can relax. I can rest. I believe that is what David is saying here. David is saying, when I see God bring his vengeance, his good vengeance on wicked people, in my heart, is is just like when I wash my feet at the end of the day, it's going to be the same thing in my soul. When I wash my feet, and and when 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 they're dead, and when their evil is done, I'm going to be like, oh, I can rest. I don't have to worry about these wicked people anymore. That's what David is saying. Now, 
You might have chosen different you know, poetic words to describe that. But David is using a very, a very applicable term in his context, in his day and age, to describe something of what he wants to feel. And that's what we feel when, wicked are, when the wicked are taken care of. But there, there's another, there's another, we can't, we get to look at verse 11. Mankind will, will say, surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely there is a God who judges on earth. When we see God bring his sword of justice against evil and wicked people, there's that, that is an apologetic that the world says, there's something to this God of righteousness, this God of goodness. When we see wickedness and evil punished, we believe that there is a good and righteous God on this earth. Now, I know when we're, 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 we're receiving this psalm, we're hearing it, and I know most of you are hearing this psalm through this lens of, how do I handle people, w- wicked and evil people towards me? And if we were to end the sermon now, I think there would be some, some, great, some great tools some great instruction for us to leave here with to say, okay, I'm going to know how to better handle injustices towards me and how to ask God for justice. But we would be doing all of ourselves a disservice if we ended right here. Because here's the thing we can never, ever, ever forget. That you and I are people that deserve the justice of God. You and I have sinned against his holiness. You and I deserve what David is asking for because of our own rebellion, because of our own sin, because of our own evil. And this is one of the hardest things for us as human beings to do is to look at our sin the way God sees our sin. It's easy for us to see the sin of other people. It's easy for us to say, God, get that person. But would none of us ever say, God, get me? But what you and I have to remember is this is why Jesus came. And this is why the cross is so important. Because he was the one who went to the cross and shed his blood for your wickedness, for your sin, and for your rebellion. And just like David has a sense of peace after washing his feet in the blood of the wicked, you and I can only have a sense of peace when we wash ourselves in the blood of the Lamb. You and I deserve punishment. You and I deserve judgment. You and I deserve hell. But God in his infinite justice and mercy poured out his wrath on Jesus so that we don't have to face it. Now, that's not automatic. And if you're sitting here this morning you're saying, well, I, I, how do I know if I'm getting the, the, the wrath of God or the mercy of God? It has everything to do with what you do with Jesus. For you, the first thing you have to do is you have to admit that you deserve the wrath of God and the punishment of God. The second thing you've got to do is you've got to trust in what Jesus did for you to take away the wrath of God from you. He's the one that spilled his blood so that you would not have to pay the penalty for your sins. And you have to entrust him with your life and choose to follow and obey obey him to make him Lord of your life. That's That's how we receive the mercy of God so that we can be washed in his blood clean. I'm not sure if you've ever done that, but if you've never made that decision and and, and put your faith and trust in Jesus and accepted his atoning blood for you, you can do that right now. You can do that in your seat. If you have questions about it, you can talk to me or one of our prayer team afterwards. But listen, one of the things I don't want to leave here is thinking, hey, all those bad people out there, God, get them. Oh God, work in my heart. Work work in my life. God, I want to see your justice in a way through the lens of the cross so that, God, I'm hesitant to ask for justice because I know what I deserve. 
So God, give, give them every opportunity to confess and, and, and repent before they, they've, they've gone too far. A couple questions and then we're done. Number one, how do you feel about the justice of God? How do you feel about God's justice? Is it, are, are you more merciful? It, makes, uh, it just kind of makes me feel uncomfortable. Or, or how do you feel about God's justice and not your justice? He's gonna, he's going, God will always apply his justice differently than you. And you've got to be okay with that. The, th- the second question is this. Who do you need to entrust to God for justice? You know, there might be someone in your life or a group of people in your life that you're saying, Ben, I feel, this is, when I read Psalm 58, that's exactly how I feel about this person, about these group of people. But I want to be the one that brings the sword. Will you entrust justice to God? Will you entrust God to bring about the right kind of justice so that they can repent, so they can turn to him? Who do you need? Who is that person? Say, God, you take them. God, you take care of this person. It's not not about me. It's not what, what I want. It's about your glory. Last question. How will you rest in Jesus' justice for you? How will you rest in Jesus' justice for you, knowing that he is the one who took the justice, the wrath, the punishment? Are you going to rest in that today? We can wash our feet. We can wash ourselves. We Listen, we can rest. We can go, ah, because of Jesus' death for us. Let's never forget that. Let's never leave that behind. And let the cross shape our understanding of the justice of God for us.